Hi, thank you for checking out this message from Ridgepoint today. This spring, our church has been going through a six-week teaching series called Who Am I Becoming? All of us are constantly growing and changing, so who do you want to be? What kind of person do you want to be? And how can you make the greatest impact on the world around you? This has been a really great series that we have enjoyed, so if you're just now joining us, I encourage you to check out whoamibecoming.org. This is a site where we have all kinds of tools and extra content that might be helpful to you. There's a small group curriculum, several extra videos and PDFs, lots of things that can help you take just another step deeper. This week, we're wrapping up this series, taking a look at how we can influence the people around us. We're looking forward to a great message from Pastor Brent, so let's get to it right now. So we've been saying it these weeks, we're not stagnant as people, like a pond just sitting there. We're always in movement. We're more like a creek or a brook or a river. And it's been said, we're either becoming more like Judas, not a good idea, or more like Jesus, like a really good idea. But we're always becoming someone. We just always are. And so if we're becoming someone, like, wouldn't it be good if the someone we're becoming is a better version than of us, right? So these weeks, we've been looking at uh, a handful of descriptions or characteristics of what we hope is what all of us want to become, right? Like, this is who we, like, we set some goals in our life. We say, God, with your help, I want to become this kind of a person. And today, we're wrapping things up on this whole idea of influencing others to Christ. Now, sometimes I drop a, a very brief summary of the whole sermon, kind of a spoiler alert right at the beginning, right out of the gate. And I'm going to do that. I'm going to give you the two things I want to say. And if you got the courage, you can just walk out right after this because there's nothing new. I'm just going to go deeper in both of these things, all right? So uh, the first one goes something like this. We all have influence over other people, every single one of us. So as Christ followers, doesn't it like stand a logic that we should use our influence to influence people to closer relationship with Jesus? So that's the first one, okay? The second thing I'm gonna say in my talk this morning is that it sure helps to have a plan. Like to have, if, if we're trying to influence people toward Christ, wouldn't it be a good thing if we had a strategy for how to do that? Like, that would be a good thing. The bottom line, just don't do nothing. I don't even know if that's good grammar, but just don't do nothing. Do something. Get a plan, all right? So let's talk about the influence thing. I got a couple, three random things about influence. And the first we've already hinted at, we all have influence. Um, some of us, understandably, have jobs or uh, situation in life where we have influence over a greater number of people. Others of us have less influence, but all of us have influence over people, all right? There are also what you call these social influencers, like these, they're usually movie stars or uh, actors, actresses, uh, athletes that have hundreds of millions of followers. Like, don't we always want, we just want to be just like Kim Kardashian, don't we? You know, so everyone has influence, right? Uh, but it can go both ways. You can influence someone positively or negatively. That's uh, just how it is. In 1 Corinthians 15, 33, it says, bad company corrupts good character. That's why since day one, parents have been telling their kids, choose good friends. Because you can put a bucket load of work into putting good character as best you can into your kids, and then they hang out with one little group of bad riffraff, and all of a sudden that bad company corrupts good character. So the influence, like it goes both ways. The devil wants us to be a negative influence and wants us to be influenced negatively. Now Jesus called us salt and light. 
Salt makes the world taste better. Light makes it look better. Like Jesus says, you're going to be an influence. So do it in a positive way. All right? Uh, and we can influence people to all kinds of things. We can influence them to a new restaurant we found. Like you can go to a friend, hey, I ate at this restaurant, and it was great. You ought to try it sometime. And what if they actually try? You just influence them, right? You can influence someone to a sports team, to a restaurant. You can influence them to a hobby. You can influence them to a greater work ethic. You can influence them in a certain character trait. But if we're going to influence someone, let's make sure it's to the positive and better yet, influencing people toward Jesus, all right? This all kind of begs the question on this, we all have influence. This kind of begs the question, how can we, how can we see our influence as a privilege, not a duty? So in Matthew 28, Jesus dropped it on us. He says, go, Make disciples, and then there are kind of two measurable actions. Baptize them and teach them, okay? Now, you don't need to be baptized to be a Christian. Every Christian should get baptized, just like every Christian should love, okay? But you don't have to be baptized to be a Christian, but baptism is kind of a a visible symbol of what's happened, and so it's kind of the start of the relationship, And then teach them is the ongoing. So when Jesus said, go, baptize, and teach, when he said this, it wasn't like, hey, uh, if you're in a good mood and you feel like it, you might want to think about doing this maybe, but you don't have to. Like, he didn't just toss it out as if you want to. This was a command. Like, it's a duty. But we all know that it's better if something that is a duty also feels like a privilege you see what like it's our duty to forgive everyone isn't it better if we want to do that it's our duty to be nice to everybody but man the ride's a whole lot more enjoyable if I really deep down I want to be nice to everyone so how do we shift on this our responsibility our duty is to influence others for Christ that's our duty Like, hell is a really long time in a bad way. Heaven is a really good thing for a very, very long time. The the stakes are high. And Jesus said, like, this this is like number one on your list. Go, baptize, tell, teach, right? Do it. But that duty, how do we shift the scale so that it might be a little more, hey, I want to do this, Okay. There is, uh, there's not a, a checklist. Oh, if I do this and this, now what I know I'm supposed to do, I want to do, all right? There's not a checklist. But there are some things that will shift the posture of our heart to move in that direction so that we actually are eager and privileged to influence others to Christ. One of, one of them is to... Uh, have a deep, a genuine, a daily gratitude. Uh, Gratitude for what God's done. Uh, Confession, I do that a lot up here because I'm me, right? I, I I have issues, but confession. I can go days without stopping to pause to realize and remember again what God has done for me. Like I get into my own little world and I do my stuff and I don't pause, I take for granted this idea that God has actually rescued my soul from hell and he's promised me heaven and he's given me purpose and peace and joy in this life and he's with me every step of the way. You know, I've been blessed, blessed, blessed beyond measure and that gratitude is one of the things that will help shift from, oh, I guess I better tell someone about Jesus, to, man, like this is, this is gonna be okay. I want to tell them, okay? So a deep gratitude for what he's done is a motivator from duty to privilege, okay? Here's a second thing. A deeper love for people, okay? So we need to pray for a deeper love for people. Now, I don't know that on most of my sermons I have much worth writing down, but you're about to hear something that's worth writing down, okay? Here it is. 
We care most about the people we love most, okay? We care the most about the people we love the most. So the people you love the most, which typically are your family and closest friends, those are the people you love the most. Those are the people you care the most about. Now, only God loves everyone, two words, equally and infinitely. Like, God does it right. He loves everyone equally, and he loves everyone infinitely. But we can't. We're, like, we're stuck in skin, and we're this side of heaven. And we, so we are going to love some people more. You are going to love your family, your kids, your grandkids, your, your closest friends more than the person you'll be parked next to at a red light at 21st and Ridge. You don't even know their name. Are they equally loved by God infinitely? Yeah, but that's just how we got limitations, okay? You will, for the people you love the most, care about their physical health. You will care about their financial health. You will care about their relational health. You will care about their emotional health. You will care about their spiritual health. That's just how it works. So, how can we expand our deep love to more people? How can we get a deeper love? Because remember, we care the most about the people we love the most. So, let's try and love. Now, no magic stuff other than what if you actually got on your knees and you literally on your knees in the morning and you did it every day for a month and say, Lord, give me a deeper love for my next door neighbor. Just give me that. I'm asking you to miraculously give me a compassion for my neighbor. Like, give it to me. Because I know when I love him, I will care about him. I will care more about where he spends eternity if I have a compassion for him than if I don't. So, Lord, give me a, passion, a, comp a compassion for my neighbor. You pray for it. A second thing to help us deepen our love for other people, which then results in greater care about their eternity and their life right now, is for us to invest in them. So Jesus said this. He says, where your treasure is, your heart will follow. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The principle is that if you invest time into somebody, you invest money into someone, you invest your energy into someone, your heart loyalty follows that. That's just how it works. Uh, and so, okay, I have a, a friend who is basically homeless and uh, he's got his issues um, he's high maintenance he's draining uh, I have a lot of crazy stories about my interactions with my friend um, the world doesn't care about him but I do and why do I care about him? He's draining, he's high maintenance, <laughs> he's irritating. I care about him because I have poured my life into him. And where my treasure is, my heart follows. So now I care about him. See? In this whole discussion, the first part of my sermon, right? <laughs> We all have influence. So let's influence people to Jesus, right? Influence can go both ways, okay? Our influence rises as our kindness rises. So be nice. Like, be nice to people because your niceness earns their trust of you, okay? And what if we said, Lord, I don't want it just to be a duty to go and baptize and teach I want it to be a privilege so would you give me that love because I don't got it I don't honestly I don't care about my neighbor's eternal destiny I don't even think about it 
I want to be able to think about it and care genuinely, so give me a love. And Lord, would you, would you look with favor on the investment I'm going to put into my neighbor? The investment. And let my heart follow my treasure so that I care from duty to privilege, okay? That's part one. Let's go to part two. It's always better to have a plan. Like, get a strategy. Like, if you come to the point and say, oh, yeah, it's my duty and it's my privilege to influence others to Christ. Well, how are you going to do that, <laughs> right? Like, and I say, just don't do nothing. Like, do something. And you've got to find a plan, a strategy that fits you and that fits them. We are all so different with our personalities and our backgrounds and all the stuff we bring into who we are and then we've got this person that we're trying to influence and each one of them is unique so don't think for a second that there's just, well if you do this, this, this and this then you're gonna influence them to Christ. But you have to have a plan, a strategy. Okay, so I'm gonna drop two examples on you. Uh, I've tried to choose examples that are broad that will fit the most number of people, okay? But if you don't like either of these, find something else, okay? But don't do nothing. Okay, here's the first one, a common strategy. It starts with prayer. Uh, prayer is not just the politically correct, spiritually correct, like, <laughs> place to start. Oh, we better pray. Uh, it really, like, the devil wants your neighbor to go to hell. He, he, like, this is the battle of all battles. It's, it's not just, oh, maybe if I just talk to him, it'll be all. No, there is a war raging for his soul between good and evil, between God and the devil. And you launch that influence through prayer. So pray by name for, for, for people. It starts with prayer. All right, praying for a soft heart on their part, praying for boldness on your part. Second thing, this is just a common strategy. Build a friendship, build relationship, build trust. Our, influ our influence rests on their trust of us. Our influence is largely dependent on whether they like us. Does that make sense? Do you like to follow someone you don't like? No. Are you more apt to be influenced by people that you enjoy being around, right? So be nice, be pleasant, be Christian, be, be good, okay? And, but you're building a relationship with them, genuinely. Now, you and I, we have an agenda behind our relationship building. Our agenda, our goal, is to lead them to Christ. Don't ever apologize for having an agenda behind your, your friendships. Now, if your friend says, are you just trying to convince me to follow Jesus? What's your answer? Yes, I am. <laughs> That's your answer. But you need to have a posture so that if they do ask if you have an agenda, they know that whether they say yes or no to Jesus, you're gonna love them the same. That your, your relationship, it doesn't hinge on whether they say yes. Your relationship hinges on their value as a person, that God loves them and you love them. So be genuine in your relationship. You do have an agenda, but make sure that you're genuine in your love for them. And whether they reject or accept Jesus isn't going to change your friendship. Okay? Build a relationship with them. And then thirdly, meet them where they're at. Back in 1975... A guy by the name of James Engel uh, wrote a book and he ended up having this, it's the chart on the left, Engel Scale of Evangelism. And if you go on the internet, there are all kinds of variations of this. But the basic idea is this. The green circles on both of these charts are the, the point at which someone surrenders to Jesus. Like they, they surrender, they say, I follow Jesus, I choose Jesus. But both of these and all the other variations of this scale realize that very few people go from no awareness of God or being an atheist to surrendering in Jesus, surrendering in Jesus in one giant step overnight. 
People come to Jesus one step at a time. So if your neighbor is a flaming atheist, aren't you going to meet him at a different place than if your neighbor says, you know, I've been having some thoughts about Jesus, and I know you go to church, can you tell me about Jesus? Okay, they're both equally lost. Does that make sense? Both of them are equally in need of a savior, but they're at very different points in their journey toward that time where they say, I'm in, okay? So meet them where they're at. They may have gone to church, they may believe in God, they may think that they can, they're good enough to go to heaven. Maybe, maybe they have church pain. They grew up in church, they kind of believe in God, they've kind of walked away because their youth pastor had an affair. And they have church pain. You see, that's why I've said over the, the months here, read the room before you lead the room. Like, know where these people are at, listen to them. Like, like Earn that trust of relationship, but meet them where they're at. And at some point, though, you got to talk. And that's the fourth thing. Now, I'm really not mad when I say this, okay? Even if I sound or look mad, I'm not mad. Just trust me. If any of you say, well, I'm an introvert, I can't, like, get over it. God made you an introvert, introvert, and he told you to tell the world, if you say, oh, I, I just bumble my words all the time. Well, the devil is putting that in your mind, not God. Sure, expressing your faith is easier for some of us than others. Absolutely. I've got a free ticket. The, the minute, I have it easy, I understand that. The minute someone finds out I'm a pastor, they just expect me to talk about Jesus. So I recognize that I've got an inroad that many of you don't. Okay, don't get bitter. Become a pastor. <laughs> it's good, okay? Uh, all this to say, I'm not angry. I'm just saying, don't fall into the lie that your personality or your, your not fluid a tongue is your escape route from the responsibility we have to speak out loud. Uh, 15, 20 seconds. Hey, uh, I don't know if you believe in Jesus or not, but all I know is that Jesus has given me purpose in life. And I get out of bed and like, I got a reason to breathe. Jesus has made a difference in my life. And I hope he can make a difference in your, I know he can. Plus, we got this heaven thing. It's true, it's real. 15, 20 seconds, I shared my story. For me, the biggest difference Jesus has made in my life now, apart from forgiving my sins, is he's given me purpose in life. Maybe he's given you peace, maybe he's re removed your shame. Maybe he's given you a family because you never had a family. We all have things that rise to the surface of what God has done for us now. You have to tell your story to your friends. They can't argue with your story. It's your story. And when I look at them and say, hey, Jesus just, I mean, I got heaven. Yeah, it's wonderful. But all I know is that he loves me and he has given me a purpose in life. And he can do the same for you, okay? So in all of this, you got to talk. It's hard. But you can do this, all right? All right, if nothing else, invite him to church. All right, here's another one um, that is common. It, it's been kind of the, the trendy one over the last couple of years. It's based on the acrostic bless. Begin with prayer, listen genuinely, eat together, uh, serve and share, okay. So, of course you begin with prayer, that's the right place, okay. Then uh, L, listen genuinely. Uh, this is part of the relationship building. One of the greatest ways to listen is to ask questions and then not correct them when they answer. So if you're in a conversation uh, and you say, you know, you believe in God, don't you? Yeah, everyone believes, I believe in God. Do you believe in heaven? Yeah. You think you're going there? Yeah, why? Well, I think I'm good enough. Say, oh, thanks for sharing that. 
If you want to talk about that sometime, let me know. But if you shut them down with a correction right then, like, and maybe your relationship is strong enough where you can get in their face and say, really? Okay, but most of the time, we need to listen. We don't always have to correct. Not right away. We're building the relationship. So you begin with prayer, you, you listen. The third one is eat together. Eating is one of the universal things that humanity does. And when you got a spoonful of mashed potatoes and you're talking, it's just it's just easier to talk, even with your mouth full. It really is. And you can do that anytime you want. I give you permission, all right? Um, eating lowers the barriers, okay? Now, some of you love to, to, to grill and you love to host. And others of you, it about puts you in a fetal position to think of inviting somebody over and having to vacuum the house and act like it's always clean, all right? And so... Maybe you don't. I, you got to find something that works for you. Go out to a restaurant, but eat together. Or have them over just for some dessert and cards. And you talk. But when you're praying and that particularly listening and eating in your conversation, here's a little shift. I want us to be intentional about what kind of things we converse about. And I have conversation vulnerabilities yeah you know you've never you haven't said those two words together today right but when you're talking with someone and trying to influence them to Christ the most common starting place is just the facts hey it's 48 degrees today hey this is where I work hey do you have a good week yeah what do you do well, I did this how many kids do you have where you know like you can have that just the facts conversation with any of the 8 billion people on the planet if there weren't culture or language barriers, right? But that's the just the facts. But as you're building relationship, listening, loving, earning their trust, you want to move to common interests because that begins to connect you. And so you, you end up realizing that they like bowling. Okay, so they like bowling. Like, you don't bowl, but you're trying to influence them to Christ. So you want to have this common interest. So you go back and you think about it at home and you do a little, and then you go back in the next conversation. Sure enough, hey, what did you, I went bowling, how was it? And then you say this, hey, do you know what? You probably know this. Uh, they have scented bowling balls. This is capitalism at its best. But on the internet, you can buy a raspberry scented bowling ball. Because when you do this, <laughs> makes it easier, okay? And so I know that sounds dumb, but what are you trying to do? You're trying to influence them to Christ. So you want to build the relationship from just the facts to common interests. Talk in their world about their show interest in them. But then we want to move to pain points. Every human on the planet has pain points. Every one of us has pain, physical pain, emotional pain, uh, mental health pain, financial pain. We've got pain with our kids or our parents or an estranged brother. We've got guilt pain and shame pain. Every human on the planet has pain. And as we pray and as we build relationship and you know as we eat together as we listen if we can bend the conversation to share some of our pain and how we have been able to cope and deal with it because of Jesus that begins to you know, see when two people can connect on pain and listen to each other the trust level goes up, and then we say, you know what? Life this side of heaven is hard, but I'm telling you, Jesus can help your pain. And there's a pain of sin that you may not even feel, you see. But move the conversation deeper, because the, this Jesus thing is a pretty deep thing. Okay? So the first S is, is um, uh, serve them. Again, we talked about how if you, you serve them, you invest in them, the relationship strengthens and their trust and your influence increase. So 
take them to the, to the doctor, feed their, feed their dog when they're on vacation, help them rake the lawn, they're working on a fence, ask to help, but do whatever you can to serve. And then the last S is to share. And again, at some point, we need to do that. That's what I got, my friends. Every single one of us has influence. So let's use our influence. For the greatest thing, okay? Seeking to move from duty to privilege, okay? And find a plan. Have a strategy. And really, if you and I could choose one person this week, a neighbor, a coworker, a, a child, a grandchild, a parent, an estranged brother, a sister, a sibling, anyway, if we could choose one person and start this, that would be a win, okay? So I, I think about this stuff, like what would it be like if in six months or a year you could look back and say those are three people that by God's grace I influenced toward Christ? Like, there is no adrenaline rush at like that, right? That is, that's why we get out of bed, to influence the world. And so, wouldn't it be great if a year from now, two years from now, three years, you look back and there was just a trail of people that you loved and listened to and ate with and were intentional in your influence and by God's grace, they accepted Christ, they are closer to Christ. I mean, that's, that's life. And what would happen if, if six months and a year from now we had another 200 people in this church and they were here because of what you did between Monday and Saturday. And what would, what would it be like if they walked in and they were met by this flood of joy and friendliness that we weren't all cocooned in our own little relationships. We go to the people we know and we yak it up a bit after church, but that we're, we're looking for who we can influence out there. Wouldn't it be amazing if we just saw dozens of people accepting Jesus? See, this is why we get out of bed, to influence people to Christ. Hmm, let's pray. Father, I thank you. You're better to us than we deserve. I pray for your church that you are building, that you say the gates of hell will not stand against. I pray against the enemy, the devil, who is hell-bent on filling hell. And we want to depopulate hell, and we want to fill heaven. Thank you for, thank you for the privilege of calling us to be influencers. And Lord, oh, give us love so our care and concern would rise. Help us to be nice so our influence rises. Help us to love well and listen well. Help us to be strategic. You are going to equip every person who is willing. You are going to equip every person to be an influencer, to draw people closer to Christ. So I thank you. I pray against, I pray against fear. I pray against excuses. I pray against the lies of the devil. And I ask in the name of Jesus that you would show favor in our church on Sunday mornings in this room and in all the Sunday school classes and Monday to Saturday that by your grace, we will be able to influence people to Christ. And I thank you, Father. I thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again for joining us online today. We're so honored that you made time to be with us today. Before we wrap things up, here are just two quick reminders for you. Easter is coming up soon, and we want to extend a special invitation to you, our online friends, to join us in person if you're local and able. Now, we're really passionate about online church, and we do our best to make these services engaging for you at home. But especially on big days like Easter, being together in person is just a whole different experience. Now, we know a bunch of you live far away or you have really good reasons to not attend in person, and we totally support you in that. In fact, if we could pray for you, you can let us know right here. But if you're relatively new to Ridgepoint and you've been checking us out online, think it over and consider joining us for one of our special Easter services. We would love to meet you and help you get plugged in if you're interested. But speaking of online resources, we still have a ton of great materials online for you for our current teaching series, Who Am I Becoming? We have that small group discussion guide that we've referenced several times, but we also have additional readings and videos and all kinds of resources 
whether you're currently in a small group or not. Now, if you're not in a class or a group and you'd like to be, you can reach out to us anytime through our website. We'd be really glad to help you with that. But this guide could also be really helpful in your personal daily devotions if you're looking to try something new. As always, reach out anytime through email or send us a message on social media if there's anything that we can do for you. We hope you have a great week and we hope to see you again really soon.